Hello. Hello, Danita. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? Good. Sorry, we, uh, would you like me to share slides? Not quite yet, please. Not yet. Okay, sure. No, because I'd like to see some of the faces that are there while we chat a bit. Sure. Um, uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself and then John, I'll pass it on to you sure. and then pass it back to me. Sure. Um, so hi everybody. So happy to see faces. Some I've seen before, some are new to me. My name is Donita Folkvane. I am the manager of knowledge management, very meta, at Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors in New York City. I am sheltering in place from my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, we are flattening the curve here. In fact, we're, we're the curve is going quite downward, but it's still, you know, um, it's 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 a it's an, a fraught time for all of us, I think. So, just wanted to to bring that into the conversation, recognize it, um, and move forward from there. Um, I met John three years ago when I took his KMI class on a certified knowledge management. And ever since then, we've become um, good friends and thought partners, and we're excited to do this um, continuation of the next session. Oh, I have a question. A displaced New Yorker asks, where in Brooklyn? Just curious. Oh, um, I am in Crown Heights. I am on Park Place between Franklin and Bedford. Don't come visit just yet. <laughs> John? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I also just uh, welcome everyone here. Uh, my understanding is you would have, everyone here would have found out about this hour um, from the Knowledge Management Institute. So yes, we're sort of representing Knowledge Management Institute here. This is a three-part series. So in fact, Danita, how about if I put up the poll? Yep. Um, here's a poll we want to put out. This is session two of a three-part session, but we've tried to design it so that you don't necessarily have to come to all three. They sort of do stand on their own, but we thought we'd ask just to get a feel for how many people came to the first session, um, whether you can remember or not. So I put an option that says, <laughs> not sure, I can't remember, which no one has used yet. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll leave the poll open for another 30 seconds or so. Actually, we've already got 28 out of 33 votes. so. 29, 30, maybe I'll just end polling there. So for everybody to see the results, here's what it looks like. 81% um, were not in the first session, Danita. So Great. I think what we talked about is maybe a quick review of session one. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah, um, but I'll start somewhere else first. Okay. Um, I like going rogue. It always keeps John on his feet. Um, so, first of all, you know, 81% of you are like, what is conversational leadership? I understand the words separately. Um, what do they mean together? Um, and so, D John and David Gertine um, created this, this concept of conversational leadership to address something that I think we're all pretty um, aware of, which is that tech especially has made it much easier for all of us to be in contact with each other, um, as evidenced by this Zoom call and texting and phone calls, FaceTime, Snapchat, all of those things. Um, but it almost feels like the conversations are getting less meaningful, less important, because they are so easily at our fingertips. We are facing an unprecedented time on the globe, especially in the United States for us with, with the, the double crises of a pandemic and um, severe racial unrest. And so now is the time to move conversations to a place where we can actually make something happen with them instead of being passive observers, instead of um, zoning out during, during times. Um, so what does that, how does that work for all of us? Um, we, if you're on this call, you've probably established some sort of rhythm in your day-to-day -day lives. And 
most, I will guess that most of you are on Zoom calls for at least half of the day. Yesterday, I was on two calls and, you know, we've been, I've been sheltering in place for four months now. And in, in two calls, somebody on the call said, this is the best Zoom call I've had since the pandemic. That's four months, right? And to me, it was a, a regular conversation, a, um, one that by chance, by design, by design, I had, I had entered into. And so for me, I was a little, um, you know, uh, impatient with where the conversation was at the time until somebody said that. And I realized that not everybody is having the kind of conversations that are actually changing who they are and changing how they interact with with the world which then begs the question what is a conversation uh i this one always stumps me because i'm like oh well is it between two people is it between a group can a conversation be one to many can it be one-on-one -on -one? can it be you know so, can a conversation happen with a piece of art can it happen with music? And I, to me, the answer is yes. And I think because of where we are with tech, we've lost some of the conversations that take place outside of Zoom calls, FaceTime, texting. Um, you know, I'm still old enough to remember writing letters to people. And yes, you could pen something very quickly in a fit of peak or in a fit of joy but the actual taking time of writing of of crafting your thoughts of crafting what was going on sometimes allowed you to take a pause and step back and go is this the conversation i want to be having and it also allowed for conversations to be over time not everything was instantaneous. Not everything happened right now. You're expected a, a response from your, uh, to an email that was sent to you two minutes ago. And if you don't respond, there's a phone call, hey, did you get my email? So taking all of that into consideration and understanding that we might need to start looking at different ways of how we converse. Um, John and David came up with a framework, the beginnings of a framework, the middles, endings of a framework. Um, and I would love to ask John to put up the framework as it is in its current state. Because part of the thing with conversation, especially in a time when we are having to have instantaneous communication is that we don't have the time to sit down and think about what the purpose is of a conversation why are we having it we go from one meeting to the next in order to fulfill our duties to get our paycheck especially when you know we're in the middle of the pandemic so if we took a moment and thought about how conversation is shaped and by what it's shaped um, John and David came up with these four key contexts, uh, four key um, words to represent how conversation happens. So the first is, is context. Um, there was a, a guy from Ohio, he leads a nonprofit there, Demario Cooper, who was having um, a meeting with some youth from his community who were all young black men and some other young black men came in who never had this opportunity to to sit in a conversation um, about what was happening and that was about the the local elections that were taking place and one of the young men said you know i've lived in this neighborhood for all of my life but i never knew where i was and so if you have a moment to set a context for a conversation who's gonna be in the room, what, um, what media will you be using? What do you want out of it? Um, is, is anything else taking away from the focus in what you're doing with the conversation? 
Then if you think about the purpose, I think a lot of people just go into meetings, go into <clears throat> even conversations with families without thinking, what, what would I like this audience to leave with? How, how do I want to, if there's any possible way that I can help move something along, then why don't I just state that? You know, is this, is the purpose to share knowledge? Is the purpose to come to consensus? Is it to brainstorm? Or is it to transfer knowledge? Like, what are we doing? And if we sit down for a moment and think about that, then you sometimes, if you think about that, then you're like, you know what, we don't actually need a face-to-face -face conversation. This can be put in an email. And if you if you say to somebody, hey, instead of meeting for 60 minutes, here's an email that it's going to take you three minutes to read, they, they will love you for a very long time. Next is enablers. What do you need in order to, to make the conversation happen that you need to have happen? Um, I'll, uh, yesterday I had a conversation in my organization that even a few years ago would have gone much differently because one of my enablers was identifying what my point of view was. And because of that, I was able to go into a conversation that could have gone off the rails in a way that was, I hope, graceful and meaningful. And, you know, I left the meeting thinking that was, that was a good conversation. And lastly, we have design. Um, again, thinking about how you want to craft a conversation, how you want to um, make something meaningful. How, what does it mean when somebody says, you know, that was the best Zoom meeting I've had since the pandemic started. That means that the people are then finding ways, finding something in themselves that responds to what you're talking about. And that to me is, is one of the, the marks of conversation. Then there's also, also this idea of self versus community ship. Um, again, going back to that young boy in DeMario's um, meeting, a lot of us don't know where we are when we start the conversation. And so if we don't know where we are, we're not sure of where we stand in the community it, that we are creating. Um, community ship is an interesting word because it's, it's trying to capture, even though the word leadership is in the conversational leadership um, title, community ship is a little bit closer to, to what we're hoping for. Leadership um, sort of by connotation implies one leader and community ship implies that we lead together that our strengths and our our purposes when when something matches what i do it's like geese right even though there is visibly one leader they switch up depending on whose whose strengths are needed at the forefront so that's um i'm going to move on to the to a recap of last meeting john unless you want to say a little bit more about the framework and mute um no happy for you okay. to move on great so um in our last meeting what we did was had john had found a clip of a conversation from the crown which is um, a well-acclaimed uh, drama i think on bbc not quite sure. And um, it was a conversation between Prince Philip and the three astronauts who had gone to the moon. And what we did was watch this conversation and it was really awkward. Like I felt sweaty watching it because I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, and so what we had everybody do, because at that time we were on a webinar, so we couldn't, um, we couldn't be in conversation with each other, was just to put in the, like, the chat and into the context, um, into the uh, Q&A, how the conversation could have gone better, looking, taking a look at what, this con what the framework is, thinking about the context, thinking about purpose, thinking about enablers, and thinking about design. Just so you know, each one of those four ideas is an entire week-long, month-long discussion as well. Um, 
So there was a lot of ability for, there was, there were some great responses as to how this conversation that was observed could have been designed better, had a better purpose, if there were different enablers, if there was a different, a different context. So today um, we're thinking about moving that conversation a little bit into your own conversations. And we'll, we'll do that in a, in a moment. Um, one of the big things both i think for i'm i'm I, john correct me if i'm wrong but i think for both of us is especially in this time of you know uh divisiveness the idea that there are different viewpoints and it's a really important concept as far as conversation is concerned to un to understand that while you can both be looking at the same thing from one perspective it looks like a six from one perspective it looks like a nine um and i see your question leslie um and i'll come in yes we will um but there are certain things for me um that it are not open to to looking at from a different perspective. Um, I will be open and honest and say, for me, racism is not a six or a nine. It just, it is a thing. Um, there's no different perspective on whether racism exists in, in this country. And that's where I will start conversations on that topic. Um, for it's the same thing with our pandemic, you know, there are different views out there. Else, but, uh, and so the, um, again, it's that it's that question of self versus community ship. You I think one of the most important things that we can do is understand where our lines are a little bit fluid. And although we might not agree with one or the other um, version of things, there are some things that you can say, okay, I can see how from your perspective, it looks like a six, um, but understanding where, where your line is drawn as, you know, no, you guys, this is a nine. Um, so those are some of the things to think about. And Leslie, you had asked a little bit more about enablers. Um, enablers can take many, many forms. So, Zoom is an enabler. You've got you've got text. You've got uh, I mean you've got tech. You've got the ability to um, uh, to think about your conversation. People can also be enablers. Like if you have to have a difficult conversation um, that is that needs uh, more support, you can you can help with someone. Um, someone coming in as 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 a support system. Um, John has some things here from a, a, a different version of the framework. And this is what, what we love about the framework is that it where where your energy is drawn, you know, to whether it's self community ship, whether it's the four um, um, external things or whether it's one of these little one of these under like under under the, the framework um so understanding like what kind of behaviors and patterns are are normal um for example just knowledge of certain things some people are not awake before 10 o'clock in the morning I mean, they're they're there, but they're not lucid. So, if you want to have a con if you want to have a really meaningful and deep conversation, you, you wouldn't schedule it for before ten o'clock. Um, there and so that's that's what I mean by enablers. And I just looked at the time and realized that I've gone over. So, I'm going to stop there and pause for a second. John, um, please take it away. And my <laughs> apologies for going over. No, you're great. Thank you. Uh... Uh, I may add just another minute or two, and then, yeah, we're hoping to do two short breakout groups where we'll mm -hmm. put you into random groups, random small groups, um, and frankly, just have you talk about the framework. I think Danita's got a really good prompt question for us. I guess a couple of things I'll, I'll add in here is, um, I don't know, just uh, the, the, thinking about conversational leadership as a field, as a discipline, and thinking of it as potentially 
you know, the, the future of knowledge management or the, the growth of, if knowledge management has headed from information management and added on experience management and added on collective organizational learning, maybe this fourth era of knowledge management is uh, shining a bright light on where we're getting slowly, slowly better and better at optimizing the flow of knowledge. Great. How about the, the content a bit, but the leadership side of that content as well? So are we having the conversations we need to be having on um, that kind of, of framing? And I guess one of the other reasons, if David were here with us, he would be saying it's, it's really unfortunate that check the meeting here. Um, uh, it is still quite common to go into organizations and find leaders that are are, are leading in an authoritative type way. It's not a very conversational type of, of leadership model. Um, so we are directly looking to address this is what leading through conversation, two-way, community ship type leading would look like. That's one major pillar, as Danita was talking about. And then the other major pillar is David would talk about complexity and sense making, which you'll see right here in the very upper left hand corner of this view. Model. And what he's saying there, you really quick. There we go. Um, is the world has changed quite a bit over the past, you know, decades or hundreds of years. We, you know, knowledge management, you'll often hear talk about first industrial revolution, second, third, fourth industrial revolution. And is it now the knowledge age or the innovation age or what are we in right now? What does the world look like that seems so different from how it's been with how interconnected we all are? And some would say um, the definition of leadership now is convening conversations that otherwise wouldn't have happened. That's what leadership is, um, as opposed to some of the other definitions. That's one way to look at it. And then in that same, convening the conversation to make sense of the complexity that we're facing. No longer is it one large transformational change management effort. It's many transformational in organization development, we talk about multiple overwhelmings. I'm overwhelmed by pandemic. I'm overwhelmed by racial unrest. I'm overwhelmed by cicadas, the bug attacking us, <laughs> right? Like there are multiple overwhelmings going on. So how, in what way can I make sense through conversation of the, the complex reality that we're facing? Oh, uh, Matthew asks, why is solution struck through? Yeah, so let's do that one and then uh, have Danita give us the, the prompt question for the breakout. Um, solutions is struck out in this model on purpose to say conversations are complex and conversations are emergent. We're not necessarily trying to, this is meant to be more of a framework and not a specific, um, can I be a bit direct and say, we love the books like Crucial Conversations, Nonviolent Communications, um, getting to yes, dealing with difficult people, healing conversations, appreciative inquiry. There are many books, many processes for, for how to have impactful or crucial or difficult conversations. Um, we're not trying to offer a single solution or a single design or a single type of conversation. The idea is the skill of conversation, the complexity of conversation will look to emerge whatever the group is ready to emerge. So it's a more complexity based approach to conversation. And then I do see Leslie's question, community ship more as active communities of interest. Um, that's a fascinating one. Yes and no. But Danita, do you mind? Do you remember the prompt? I do remember the prompt. So we can do a couple of breakouts. Sure. Sure. Um, so the, in the first session we did, it was um, an observing of a conversation that was taking place external to you, um, using the framework, understanding how that worked, um, to figure out how that conversation could have gone differently. So now we're moving it to you. What are the conversations that you are having or that you would like to have in which 
a framework like this could help, could move the conversation forward? How can a framework help you have better conversations? Nice one. All right, so let's do, looking at the clock, 11.28. I would like to do two rounds. So if my math is right, I think we can do 12 minutes. So you'll be in groups of four, give or take a person. Um, I'll give you a five minute warning and then Zoom is gonna give you a one minute warning to bring you back to this room. And then we'll do one more 12 minute round before we close as a full group. So let's, uh, let's pop off to uh, breakout rooms. Ready, set, go. All right. Oh, there's Steve. Steve, Hello. good to see you. Got half of the room's back and everyone will be back in about five seconds. Welcome back to the main room. Let me click a button to recreate all of these rooms. So if we're lucky, it should put you, if, if Zoom works for us, it should randomize all these groups and put you in a new group of people. Um, we've put the question, the prompt question up on screen for you, if that helps to, to hear it again, it might be a slight variation. Um, given the conversations you're having right now in your world, in your life, does this framework, does this conversational leadership framework offer a different perspective for those conversations you're having right now? And I think we've got time for about 12 more minutes. So one more round of, um, a group conversation about that question. Ready, set, go. All right, five seconds. I like that. Two, zero. I like it. Okay, I think we are all back in the main room. So we've got, oh, five or seven minutes left to basically have a, uh, a group level conversation at this point. So anybody want to chime in first with how your breakouts went or what's going through your mind at this point? Hey, John. Um, one of the things that really came up in the last seconds of um, one of the breakout rooms that I was in uh, is that um, how, how do you feel or how do you break down hierarchies, right? Wow. And so, Danita, you brought up the conversation between Prince Philip and the astronauts. And so the, um, I thought that it, I mean, he, he actually put the astronauts on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. And so that made the conversation non-existent because they were just ordinary men, you know, complaining about you know, being nervous or whatever. Um, and, and they were just common down to earth guys. And so we were saying, um, and Leslie put this well, is you need to keep the, um, the conversation flat. So everybody's at the same level. And that's, yes, yes and, and that's how it could freely flow. The conversation can freely flow. And so, so Karen, uh, Brian, if I may, with, with John and Donita's permission, um, okay, so I work for a military organization, and I've worked with three stars, two stars, and one star generals. And it, it's amazing at what you just said, because the strongest relationships I have with with senior leaders are those senior leaders that I did not know were senior leaders. They were the ones that I met, you know, talking about how bumpy the flight was when we we're getting our luggage. And making those interpersonal communicate those those connections, and, and and you have to assume this role because of hierarchy, and and what you guys discussed in that breakout is so key because it is a true barrier to connection with people. Um, it's the big, it's one of the single biggest challenges I have. Um, so thank you for getting that out there. Well, you're welcome. I mean, I wish we had more time to discuss it, but it was interesting, and yes. Um, you, the, um, I mean, being in front of a three star when they're not really wearing their three star, um, and they they make you feel at home. And I I, got, I think it's it, leadership or leaders need to bring those good manners into the mix 
Um, good manners is making other people feel comfortable. And so that I think that's a learned behavior or a learned skill by leadership is um, making people feel at ease, right? So there you go. Thank you. John asked a question last time that was really amazing, which is um, it, what would it look like if your team was so cohesive that nobody could tell who the leader was? Um, wouldn't that be a good thing? Because then you have you have full transparency. No one's going to be inhibited uh, of stating their voice. Um, and so again, uh, there are certain times where you have you as a leader or you as a, a higher level or a, or a senior a manager have to state your position. But if you want that free flowing, uh, full transparency among a group, you do have to come um, have some equal footing. Well, leadership right. doesn't necessarily go with rank, right? Like if you have, I mean, if yeah. you don't know what the ranks are, you have an opportunity for people to step up being leaders in, in the area of their expertise. So, so you have rotating leadership. So leadership is not a bad thing, of course, right? But um, you should be a leader in your expertise, not necessarily because you have rank, whatever, star, but because you're a leader. Well, I, I mean, at least at least in my environment, it's both. There's a protocol right. that, that you abide by, but, but there's situational leadership as well. And um, like you said, I, I totally in agreement. It's just with a different facet. I think part of it, too, is in the, the way that each leader handles it. Because because as you mentioned, I think most of the time, especially if we're in a meeting, and a lot of this is, we're talking about meetings. If you're in a meeting, you know who the leader is. Um, and if you're in an organization, regardless of how you want to try to restructure things for the meeting, you still know who the leaders are. Um, but I think that a, a lot of what can happen is that if the leaders take a different attitude. So as an example, where I work now, um, our CEO, in the meetings we're in, he asks a lot of questions and he uses a lot of humor. And I think that really helps because he's not dictating things. Uh, he's very inquisitive, curious, and he'll ask the different people in the meeting, you know, what do you think and why? And he asks a lot of, you know, not leading questions. Uh, I'm not sure how to phrase the question. Um, but yeah. I'm sorry, I, I keep looking out the door because I have somebody trying to get my attention asking me if I'm, a, if I'm on a phone call. Sorry about that. Yeah, we were talking about how, lead, how conversational leadership should actually include a lot of listening. For sure. I'm sorry. I, I no, heard something a while back. I like all these little quips, as John knows. But one of the things I heard uh, you know, 20 years ago or so just about dialogue is the acronym talk and for talk they use tell ask listen and keep an open mind and i i, I just always keep coming back to that you, know, you you certainly have to tell you can't have a conversation without both people having uh, putting some input but then ask the questions and and as you said listen and throughout the whole thing stay curious and keep an open mind and i think that you know that will help as well All right, that might be time. Um, still maybe have a minute left. Any final comment or question from anybody? I'll just throw in that in our breakout groups, both of them actually, we discussed how this framework really facilitates relearning what conversation really is and, and um, enables us to learn that maybe we should do less talking at each other and and relearn the art of conversation so I, i'm appreciating seeing this framework out on the screen and being able to utilize it in in all future conversations oh, love it thank you austin um i see Danita's clapping too uh yeah one of the things uh, we talk about in conversation and we'll practice in this little workshop we're putting together is um uh just like 
being respectful of all kinds of conversations, but even more awareness of, um, David Gertine uses this phrase, um, parallel soliloquies, when it's, uh, I'm talking for a while, and then someone else gives a speech for a while, and then someone else gives a speech for a little while. I mean, I don't know if we need to judge, is that a conversation, yes or no? I mean, it's some kind of conversation, and sadly, maybe that's a very common type of conversation, as opposed to it, welcoming others into the conversation and repeating back what someone else just said and building on it and, you know, that kind of just different types of conversations, different types of being aware of your responses um, and your listening um, during a conversation. Danita, do you want to bring us yeah, on? We have one more request for a copy of the framework. Sure. Um, and I, I will say, you know, like, as I mentioned, John and I have known each other um, for three years, and I would say we've been friends for about two and a half. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, just recently, I've started, after John has said something, stumbling, because I, I'm like, oh, I was actually listening to what you said, rather than trying to formulate my own, own answer. And something that would normally be embarrassing or um, could be seen as a gaffe or whatever. Um, I just, I was like, hey, that means that we're getting to a level of conversation that I really enjoy, where we're listening and absorbing and then responding. So thank you all so much for, for being here and for, um, for opening up your conversations. And hopefully this means that you can open some conversations or continue some conversations in your lives in a way that makes you that much more whole. Thank you all for hosting. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.